Welcome here. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at the Open Door. I'm glad you can join us. I'm not going to be that funny, just so you know. Michael Jr. is his name. I suggest you look some of his stuff up. He's, uh, he's really good. We're taking a break this morning, actually, from our, our We Believe series. And, and so um, I've been going through this We Believe series about the, the cores of what we believe. And, and, and this actually today is still a part of our core. It's just, it's just not part of our statement of beliefs. And so I, I want to take a break because this last Monday, uh, we had a course that uh, uh, Pastor Keith Eberhard from Church of the Rock was teaching at, uh, at the, the church offices and, and a number of you were there. And uh, I just want to piggyback off of what he was talking about. You see, he was talking about prayer. And, and it's this interesting thing that we, we experience as Christians in that the Bible commands us dozens of times to pray. And it talks and explains and it shows the power and the value of prayer. And we see time and time again throughout the Bible and, and even in our own lives with the people around us, the, the power and the authority and the healing and the change and, the, and, 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 and just all of the amazing stuff that happens through prayer. And yet, I bet if I would ask each one of you about your prayer life, almost to a man and woman and child, we'd feel like, like it's lacking. So, so what even is prayer? Why do we pray? How do we pray? Like, I think some of these basic fundamentals are, are maybe lost, and we see people like, like Michael Jr. is talking about, and they're praying up a storm, and it looks so impressive, maybe. Maybe the words they use seem so right, and it seems like we're using wrong words maybe or doing it the wrong way and so i just want to take some time this morning and go over exactly what is the bible saying about prayer now last week i was talking about jesus and i talked about how we sinned right we we were sinners we were born into sin even as as, as children and that jesus died to make us right with god and, and i just want to read romans 5 verses 6 to 11 it says for while we were still helpless at the appointed moment Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, perhaps, someone might even dare to die. But God proves his love to us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, while we still, our nature, our our core was against God, Christ died for us. Much more than, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, We will be saved through him from wrath. Now what that means is, if God loved us so much, well, we hated him that he died for us. Now that we've been made right with God, and that that we've been made holy with God, how much more so are we spared from his wrath and in his righteousness? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled. I want to come back to that word reconciled in, in a few seconds, but we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, that how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have now received this reconciliation through him. And that word reconciliation, we don't use it super often anymore, but it's a really simple word. It basically means to be made right with. We were made right with. We are squared up with. In in accounting, you might use the term reconciliation. It just means to match one account with another. To make the accounts square and even. So we were made square. We were made even. Our debt was paid. We are on right relationship and even terms with God. And that's so much more than an accounting term in this sense. It means that we were literally made right with God. We were brought into a relationship with God. And prayer is communication with God in that right relationship. It's, it's the fruit. It's the sign of that healthy relationship. You see, Jesus died not just to keep us out of hell. I, I don't know if you know this, but, but Jesus didn't just die to keep us out of hell. We were made right with God, which means we were put back into a, a right relationship, an original state. And in, and in the Garden of, of, Eve, or of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, right, we weren't made by God to not go to hell. That's not a purpose. We, just, we didn't have to be made, I guess, in that case, if we were made to not go to hell. So that reconciliation wasn't just to keep us from hell, but it was for something. We were made for a purpose originally, and we were brought back into right relationship with that purpose. And that purpose in the Garden of Eden was to have a relationship with the Creator. 
to be made for relationship. That relationship takes communication. So many Christians, so many believers, so many of us here today, we live our lives like we were in jail and we got pardoned or paroled. So now we're out of jail. Thank God we're out of jail. And th- but then we live our life day to day like, like, like pardoned convicts on parole. Like, like keep your head down. Don't make trouble. Don't fuss. Make sure you periodically check in with your parole officer and just try not to go back to jail because you mess up once and you're back in jail. We're not paroled convicts. We are set free and made right. We're, made, we're reconciled with God. Our debt's paid, it's wiped clean, and it's gone. We're not on parole. And so that communication with Jesus, that communication with God, we call that prayer. And it's, it's not a fancy word. It means to talk with, to listen to, to have relationship with God. And it's an integral part of what it means to be a Christian, to be a believer. Uh, I was talking with, a, with a, a father earlier this week, and, and he's got a son in a different province. And I asked if they were close. And this is what the guy said. He said, oh yeah, we talk probably every other day on the phone. Instinctively, the guy knew the sure sign that they were close was that they talked often. And in fact, if they wouldn't talk for, let's say, a week or two weeks at a time, he would call and get worried because he'd wonder what had happened to his son. Because talking frequently was the sign of a good relationship, and in fact, it helped make a good relationship. So it's like a chicken and egg argument where the conversation and the communication and the knowing about, the, about what's going on in day-to-day life helped build the relationship, and then out of that well-built relationship came the conversation. And it grew, and it grows better. That's what prayer is. It's, it's both the fruit of being made right, and it's part of having that right relationship. Y- you chat, you talk. But a lot of us, we don't pray much. And we certainly don't pray out loud. And we certainly don't pray out loud in front of other people, because that would be embarrassing. I mean, maybe if we're in, like, big trouble, I mean, uh, I can't count how many times I've seen on Facebook uh, pray for Fort McMurray or some variation thereof from people who have never prayed. Or if they have, they've certainly never prayed out loud. Suddenly when there's a a trial or a tribulation or a big illness or a... Suddenly people will maybe squeak out a little SOS prayer. But it's, it's, it's thin and hollow because it doesn't come out of a fruitful relationship. And I'm not saying don't pray in a time of of worry or trouble or strife. What I'm saying is it should come as an extra prayer on top of a deep relationship that's happening on a daily, hourly basis. Um, I knew this guy who remained nameless, because some of you might know him, who when he became a teenager, became inexplicably embarrassed of his parents. I don't know, do do you know anybody that? Maybe you were that person. You became a teenager, you had 13, 14, 15, 16, whatever it was, and you just became entirely embarrassed about your parents, didn't want to be seen with them. And, and we were at baseball games, this guy and myself, and, and I had a little bit of cash in my pocket, so I bought something from the canteen. Well, he wanted something from the canteen too, but his parents had the money. So, so he came up, and he stood probably about three, four feet away from his parents, and he mumbled something about, <clears throat> Mom, Dad, can I have some cash? He looked over the other way. Dad said, What? <clears throat> I want some cash. His mom reaches into his pocket and picks out a couple of dollar bills and says, yeah, yeah, sure, pick up something for your little brother too. And the guy turns beat red, Mom, come on, not in front of my friends. As if it's somehow just like deathly embarrassing to be taking money from your parents when you asked your parents for money. It was completely confusing. I never did anything like that, I promise. I'm sure neither did you. My mom's in the audience laughing right now. No, there comes a stage where many teenagers become horrifyingly embarrassed of their parents. They're happy to live rent-free at home, right? But they want to stay in their room until they need food or laundry, and then they come down, say the minimum number of words, and run back to their room. And, And as adults, we look down on teenagers like that. We're going, come on, be grateful. Your parents are... But how many of us treat God the same way? We stay in our room... We come out a little bit embarrassed, hope nobody sees us talking to God, grab what we need and leave. That doesn't sound like reconciliation to me. We weren't made for that. We were made for so much more than that. 
Would your life look different if you had a relationship with God on a daily basis? If you knew he was aware of what you were going through? If you knew he cared about what was happening in your life? If you know what stuff God cared about in your life? If you knew that any time, day or night, you could communicate with the God who's right now controlling the rate of fusion at the center of suns all over the galaxy, that God was ready to listen to you at any moment, would that change your life at all? Would that change your life if you realized that the God of all power and authority who created heavens and earth cares about you and wants to have a relationship with you? Would that change your life at all? It changes mine all the time. And that all comes through prayer. It comes through knowing and being known by God. And here's the great thing about that. Jesus says, my, she- my sheep will know the shepherd and they will know his voice and he will call them by name. How do you get to that kind of relationship where you know the sound of Jesus' voice and he calls you by name? That sort of intimate relationship. I mean, how do you get there? And, and, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the secret to how you get there. It takes time. You've got to spend time. You've got to spend time with Jesus. You've got to spend time listening. You've got to spend time in that relationship. If you want to have a good relationship with your kids, you spend time with them. If you want to have a good relationship with your spouse, you invest time in him or her. There's no shortcut. When you were dating your your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend now, what do you do? You call them up. You chat on the phone. You you text them. You go down. You see them. You you go on dates. you, You invest time in a relationship. That's how you get there. There's no shortcut. Jesus said in in John 15, verse 7 and 8, says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, remain, that, that sense of constancy, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified in this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Jesus says God is glorified when you produce fruit, when good things happen through you. I'll tell you how you know if you're spending enough time with God. If everything you ask for, God gives you. Because you know his will and his heart so well that everything you ask for is in line with his will and his heart and it's his good glory to give it to you. And other than that, we just got to spend time in the presence of God, praying for him, seeking him, listening to him. But how do we do this? I think for many of us, we just don't know how. We feel like we don't have the right words. Maybe we feel like, like Michael Jr., you've got to make up some fancy prayer. Or maybe we feel like um, our prayers won't be answered. I mean, I think the biggest things for many people is we feel like we don't know how, we don't think it matters, we don't know how to listen, and we don't know what to do if God says no, or not yet, or not quite. Number one, and th- this is not an exhaustive list of things to realize when, about, about prayer. But it's just, it's some of the things. And number one, be honest. God made you. God meets you where you're at. God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful, and he's all-present, which means wherever you are, God is there. He knows you. He made you. He knit you together. He understands you. You can communicate to God the way you can communicate, and he'll understand you. Just be honest. Be who you are. In fact, a uh, wonderful verse here. Philippians 4, verses 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. On Thursday, I was working on this, on this message, and I was really distracted. I had a bunch of stuff going on in my life, and I was having a hard time working on it. And, and so I decided I'd pray. Now, I don't do well sitting behind a desk with my hands folded and my head bowed and my eyes closed. Oh, dear Jesus. I get too distracted. I'm too antsy. I have to, as you can tell by me walking on stage, I have to move to think. I have to move to focus. And so I go for a walk when I pray. I usually do prayer walks. And so I was walking on Thursday. And I was just saying, God, 
I'm really frustrated. There's some stuff that is really big that I have no control over in my life, and it's really distracting, and there's some people, and they're taking up a lot of time in my life, and, and I feel like i got limited resources, and I'm having a hard time focusing on this message, and I want to do a good job, and on Sunday, I want to be able to convey how meaningful prayer is to me, how powerful it could be, and I'm, I'm just talking to God. I, I didn't use any fancy words. I literally, like what I just said now, that's basically what I said. Well, that was easy. I just told God what was on my mind. I was honest, and he listened. The Bible says, in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Well, those were my requests. Now, here's the second thing that can sometimes hinder our prayers. Maybe we get that part right, but then we don't listen. And I, I fall into this all the time. I'm going a mile a minute, whatever, and I don't take time to listen. Because here's the deal. God wants to have a relationship God doesn't want to be Santa Claus, have you come sit up on his knee, tell you the things you want for Christmas, and then leave. He wants to have a real relationship, a a father-son, a father-daughter relationship with you. And that takes communication both ways. Plus, if you have the ear of the creator, wouldn't you like to hear what he has to say anyway? I mean, honestly. So last Thursday, I prayed. I said exactly what I just prayed. And then I stopped praying and I just kept walking, and I listened for maybe like 15 minutes, and God didn't say anything. I just enjoyed his nature and the beauty outdoors, and I just enjoyed it, and then, and then I heard his still small voice. I don't always, every time I pray, I don't want to sound like every prayer I have, God's voice thunders down and he talks to me, but if you listen long enough, he speaks. He honestly does, and this will look different for each one of you, or it could look different, because God will communicate to you in a way you understand. I, I, I'm daft. I don't catch signs and wonders. He's got to speak to me or I don't hear it because that's just how I am. So I prayed, and then, and then God, God spoke back to me. And, and he said, Jason, those aren't distractions. Those aren't distractions on your kingdom building. That's your kingdom building. The, the people who are using up all your time and energy, yeah, that's because they're the people I gave you time and energy for and I've brought into your life right now. So they're not distractions. That's your role right now. I went, oh, well, thank you, God. Now I see my whole day differently. These things that were unnecessary. For, basically, God said, I give you permission to lay some of the things down you think are important to pick up the things I think are important. I went, oh, well, now I look at it differently. And I'm not saying my life just suddenly became magically easier on Thursday. I'm just saying I had a different focus. So now when those, those weary burdens came at me, I go, no, those aren't weary burdens. That's actually God's role for me right now. Doing this well is what God wants me to do. Well, if I had just prayed, see, because we, in our human infallibility, we pray sometimes and ask for things that aren't quite right. And God can guide us and correct us. We have to listen, be in relationship, to speak and to hear. In fact, uh, Jeremiah 33, verse 3, God says, call to me and I will answer you. He wants to answer you. He says, he says, talk to me and I'll talk back and tell you great and incomprehensible things you do not know. I want to know that. I want to know great and incomprehensible things I don't know. I want to know what matters to the heart of God. I want to know what, what God sees when God sees my community and the people around me. I want to know what God's heart is beating for because wherever God's heart is beating, that's where I want to be working. That's where I want to be spending my time. That's where I want to be resting is where God's heart is beating. And he'll tell me if I ask him. So be honest and take time to listen. This isn't like super difficult. It's a spiritual discipline. And we hate that word discipline. It sounds so dry and rote. There's a, there's a wonderful story. And it might be not true. It might be apocryphal. It might be real. It's very muddy about where this all came to be. But Gary Player, the great famous golfer, says, apparently, years and years and years ago, he was golfing in Texas. And he was, he was in, a, in a practice bunker. And, and, and he, he chipped a shot and right in the hole. Perfect shot. And, and a guy was walking by. And he says, 50 bucks in it for you if you can do it again. Lines up, gets a shot, in the hole. The guy says, yeah, well, 100 bucks if you can do it a third time. Lines up, chips a shot, in the hole. So the guy's 
shelling out a couple of bills to, to Gary Player. He says, man, I have never seen a guy that lucky. And apparently they invented the saying right there, the harder he practiced, the luckier he got. It's no accident. Yeah, he doesn't get it in 100% of the time, but I get it in 0% of the time because I don't practice golf because I hate golf. The more you practice, the more you do something, the better you get. The, the easier it becomes. If you want to be God's sheep and to hear his voice and to know him by name, spend time with the shepherd. There's no shortcut to sheep knowing the shepherd's voice. They have to spend time together. They have to face the wolves and the eagles and the, and the howling wind and the rain together for years. And then they know each other. It just takes time. And if it feels awkward at first, press in. Everything feels awkward at first. It just takes time. Lastly, and this one seems to get people a lot, and I understand why, because it's gotten me a lot in my life. What happens if God says no? Or not quite, or not yet, or not in the way you thought? I think many of us are very worried. Maybe we'll pray in our minds. Or maybe if nobody's around, we'll do that really weird thing where we pray out loud, but nobody's listening. But if anybody's around, we clam up. You notice that? Nobody wants to pray out loud near somebody else. And I think for a lot of it, well, number one, I think we're worried that we're going to sound funny. But number two, I think we're most, mostly worried, what if God says no, or not yet, or not quite? And we look foolish, or God looks weak, or we look silly. In case you're wondering... At one point in time, near the end of Jesus' ministry, there was a town that didn't receive him. And James and John said, Lord, let me pray and I'll call down fire and burn the town. Okay, that's a pretty epically bad prayer. Right? And Jesus rebuked them and kept walking with them. Right? There, there is no prayer so bad that people should laugh at you or that God will think less of you. Right? But yes, yeah, sometimes we get it wrong and God does say no. Um, there's a, a little picture I saw floating around Facebook um, that really summed up parenting quite well. I want you to have everything in this world that your heart desires. Kids says, can I have ice cream? Well, no. Well, was the parent being disingenuous? No. They do want everything. I want everything my child desires. I also want her to desire the right things. It, it's twofold. My will for my child is sort of complicated. If anybody or anything tries to frustrate what my daughter is trying to do, I will stop it. I will break that barrier. I will not rest until I see my daughter's true wishes and heart come to fruition. I also want to guide her wishes and her heart to what is proper and good for her. Eating ice cream all day, staying up all night, watching nothing but TV, isn't good for her. And I know long term will regret it. In fact, I was just talking at the table earlier today. When I was in grade seven, we just did everything in metric uh, when I was going to, to school. But when I was in grade seven, we were doing some fractions. And inexplicably, we didn't know why, he didn't explain it well, my teacher started drilling us on the numerical values for eighths. One eighth, three eighths, five eighths, seven eighths. Why? The three decimal places were memorizing just one weird subset of fractions. Why not fifths? Why not thirds? Well, thirds are pretty easy for that matter, but why were we drilling eights? I didn't get it until I got older and I started doing carpentry. And believe it or not, nobody uses metric in carpentry. They all use inches and feet. And when you do that, you need to know eighths of an inch. And suddenly this, this information was useful. Well, if you were to ask grade 7 Jason if he wants to memorize a chart of three decimal places of eight, I'd have said no. But I was thankful later because I've been guided down the right path. Well, that's a small example. We don't always know what's best for us. We don't always know. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. A lot of my prayers, I, I'm tempted to say the majority of my request prayers God says, no, not yet, or not quite. I'm okay with that. That doesn't worry me. I don't think God's weak. I think God's so strong and so smart, he knows better than me. If every time I asked for something, God gave it to me, I'd get concerned about this God because I don't have the best heart. And I don't have the best mind. But I ask for things, and then when God says no or yes, I can learn about his will from that. 
and when I ask for things that he says not quite or not yet, I can learn about his sense of patience, or I can learn about the way he wants to answer prayers. I've learned that when I pray for patience or I pray for wisdom, he almost always answers me. When I've prayed for him to remove an obstacle, he almost always says no, because he wants me to overcome the obstacle. I've also learned that if I pray too small, he almost always says no. If I say, God, give me peace in the situation, so often I hear him say, no, 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 no. I want to give you victory. And that's going to take a little bit more work and a lot more time. But I actually don't want you to have peace in this. I want you to have victory. And I'm willing to walk with you for the months or years it takes you to get victory. I'm learning God's heart and God's mind by praying and being told no. That's fine. And unity. We pray alone way too much. We honestly pray alone too much. The Bible says it this way. Matthew 18, 19 to 20. This is Jesus' word speaking. You can't get more authoritative than this. Again, I assure you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. There is a power and an authority and a, and a heart that is different when two or more Christians gather together in agreement about something and pray together. And we are all too often praying alone. And alone makes us easy pickings. See, when two of us get together, the one can learn from the other, or the other can teach the one. Where one gets weary, the other one can be encouraging. Where one hears God's voice in one way, another hears God's voice in another way. And you can learn, you can develop unity and strength. There's a, a multiplicity that happens when two or more people are gathered together, and there's power and authority in that. And that takes getting over ourselves and praying with other people. It takes getting over our, sometimes pride, sometimes false humility, sometimes it's shame or worry or inexperience and praying with other people. Now the reality is, I said this was a spiritual discipline. I can talk about this. I could do a 7,000 part series on prayer and if we don't pray, we haven't learned anything because there's nothing I can say or that you can read in a, in a book that will help you with prayer. And some of you are already smiling because you know what comes next in this part. But here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to get the band to come up in a little bit. And we're actually going to pray. I'm going to get them to hold off on playing for, for just a minute or two. Um, and we're going to pray for each other. And now, we sometimes have people up here on the prayer team and at their service. And, and we offer it up that we can pray for people. And sometimes people come and that's great. And sometimes they don't. And, and that's fine. Nobody has to. Today we're doing something different though. Today we're going to get prayed for or we're going to pray for someone else. And I know that's going to make so many of you so uncomfortable. And that's all right. It's part of growth. Growth is always uncomfortable. Here's the deal. Um, if you were at that prayer uh, teaching on Monday, I want you to come up. Stand in front here. And if you are part of the regular prayer team and you just couldn't make it that day, I want you to come up. And if you lead a small group and you couldn't make it there, I still want you to come up. So I want all of those people, if you either lead a small group if you were at that prayer teaching or you're part of the leadership team, I want you to come up here. And I'd like you guys to just to divide you up into three groups. We'll get one in the center, one on the side, and one over there. Just kind of approximately equally divide yourselves up into three groups, okay? I'll just give you a couple of seconds. And I'd like everybody who's sitting right now, everybody who's sitting, to be prayed for before you leave. And this isn't going to be, I mean, simply just by sheer numbers here, not everybody's going to get 25 minutes of powerful intercessory prayer. But we're going to pray for each person. Because the reality is we can pray simply. Because the Bible says God knows what we need before we ask for it. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit can pray and intercede on our behalf when we don't even know the words. When we don't even know what to pray. When our, when our groanings come out, the Holy Spirit can pray on our behalf. And that's even more powerful than anything we can pray anyway. But we want to be faithful. So I would like everybody who's seated here to come up for prayer yet. And we'll, we'll, I'll explain this a bit in a second. Uh, I know we have a full takedown after this. And so if, if you guys can just stick around after you've been prayed for and we'll help. But just hold off stacking the chairs for a little bit just to not make the noise. And here's the deal. You guys are very loosely in thirds. We'll get you to move over a little bit. If you can come to the center a little bit, this group. Okay, so, so here's the deal. We're going to pray for three. Each of these groups is going to be praying for one specific uh, kind of thing. All right? 
and I, and I want you to kind of go up to whichever side you want. I know this is embarrassing. You're going to feel like, oh, man, people will know what my problem is. Well, these are vague, and it doesn't really matter, and nobody's judging you, and if they are, you can judge them because they'll be coming up here anyway, so it doesn't matter. So we're going to get this group over here to pray for broken relationships, and we're going to believe and pray for healing in broken relationships because the reality is Jesus told us to pray, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So even though we don't always understand God's multi-tiered, kind of complicated parental will for us, the reality is anything on earth that is not as it is in heaven is a great thing to pray against and to believe that God can work in. And so that group will be praying for broken relationships that need healing, that you want to be made better, whatever. This group in the center, I'm going to get praying for broken bodies. For people who have ailments in their bodies, who want to see healing, who want to see things made better, made well. And we're going to believe in this group that God actually wants to heal us, that God actually cares for us like our children. And yes, he says not yet or not quite sometimes, but God also answers yes right now and gives us guidance. So this group here is for people who have uh, illness, soreness, um, broken bodies, right? And this group here, we're going to get them praying for uh, emotional healing. So it's relational healing, physical healing and emotional healing, for scars, for wounds. If you've been hurt in your past, and you know that's bothering you still, if um, you have anything that you need emotional healing for, I won't go through the list. You guys know who you are. I want you to come to this group. And like I said, not everybody's going to get 25 minutes of power of intercessory prayer, but there's power in praying. And if I can get each person in the prayer, if you guys can just form teams within reason, teams of two, we're going to pray together in unity. And it won't always work out. There might be some odd people out. So I'm going to get you guys to come forward now before we start playing, because otherwise you're going to want to sneak out at the back when nobody's praying. Come forward now. And as you do, I'm just going to pray uh, a blessing over these people, and then Joan will close. You can come forward. I know it's hard to get up your chairs, but you can come forward while I pray. Heavenly Father, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of your word. We believe in the power of your spirit to move and breathe and give action. And God, right now, we want to come forward in faith and come forward even through the embarrassment and the whatever concern. I just pray right now, God, you would move mightily. You would bless those people praying. I know they're only human, but God, your spirit moves in them. And I just pray you'd bless them and you would empower them.